Two years ago, Nancy and I visited artist Scott Noel in his studio so I could film him starting a portrait of her. Last Saturday, we saw him again at Gross McLeaf. Here's my conversation with Scott, followed by a few observations of my own about this extraordinary artist. Scott, you have been such a mainstay of the Philadelphia art community for decades, and here we are at the opening of another fantastic show. How did you get to this point? Well, my life as a painter in Philly began in 1980 when I had my first one-person show at the Fleischer Art Memorial. So this is 44 years now, and a lot of shows in Philadelphia across three or four different commercial galleries, but the longest lived has been here at Gross McLeaf now for 25 years. I had a long run-up to that in great places like the Moore Gallery and the Mangle Gallery. But it was here at Gross McLeaf that I began to show my most ambitious and personal work, large figure compositions, themselves a kind of anthology of all the things that I care about. The figure, still life, interior space, landscape, even sometimes cityscape gets into these large paintings. They all are part of a fabric that I've tried to integrate and pull together running them up against my admiration for the great painting of the past, allusions to artists like Veronese and Velasquez and Titian and Poussin. At least my understanding of those artists as they relate to my imagination. What have you discovered about yourself through painting? I've learned how important work is to me for a sense of feeling like life is worthwhile. I have an intense sense, I think as most artists do, of things that are felt beautiful in the world and around me. But until those things are embodied in work of some kind, things that I make, they don't quite hold. It's not quite enough. Beauty as an enterprise is very much tied to some act, something made. It's as if the world is a continually evolving poem. But as some critic once said, the best response to a beautiful poem is another poem, not an act of critical analysis. So the world hits me as something so intensely beautiful. And it's more so as I've gone on as an artist. I don't think I felt the world as emotionally when I was a young man as I do now as a much older man. And I think painting has engendered that. Painting makes the world have a deeper and richer flavor. And I don't know what I would do without it. The periods of time when I can't paint for whatever reason are usually a time of declining morale precipitously declining morale. When I'm painting, everything is great. Even if the paintings are lousy, painting is itself such a, a nourishing activity. There are two subjects that I want to ask you about, and I think I'm going to try to combine them. Basketball and women. Nancy and I just watched the iowa Yukon game. Just astonishingly exciting. I don't know if Iowa can beat South Carolina, but the role of women in our society, it's just so different now than it was when we were in our 20s. And basketball, when you first started painting these basketball paintings, you were pretty good at basketball. And now you're, you said you were 68, you're probably still pretty good, but talk about women and basketball, the nude and all of that kind of stuff, the role of women in your art. That is a great, great question that pulls a lot of things together. When I first started playing basketball, it was the center of my ego identity. It was the thing most important to me as a teenager, even though I was making drawings. When I got through my art education, basketball became important again because I was anxious to find an excuse to put figures in movement in some context that was meaningful to me. 
I couldn't very well make religious paintings, although crucifixions and descents from the cross were always in my mind as things that were visually very exciting, especially the examples of Veronese and Rubens. And so secretly, when I started making basketball paintings, I was trying to hybridize the weird bravado and masculine energy of the playground with a very, very subtle religious longing that was in me then and is still there, although I'm not terribly pious. The other thing that got more and more important to me as I entered early adulthood was my fascination with women, the world of women, my love of women. So I'd make lots of portraits and nudes to exercise that drive. But somewhere about 30 years ago, I started thinking about returning to the playground and why couldn't women be on the playground with men because they were, you know, when I'd look around on the street. And the first major figure pageant I made was based on the Iliad. And I inserted a bunch of athletically clad women in the roles of Helen and Cassandra and Andromache. But they were playing in the game that was off to the left side of the composition. The most recent painting is a further evolution of this, and it fits a lot with the question you asked, John, because the title of the painting is Parker Street Shootaround, but the subtitle is Hippomenes and Atalanta. And it's a funny myth in Ovid of a fleet-footed half-god princess named Atalanta who does not want to marry. She wants to live the virginal life of a devotee of Diana. But her father asks her to marry. He needs an heir to the throne. Atalanta resists and then says, okay, dad, I'll marry but the man I marry must beat me in a foot race. And at the center of the painting, I have a running woman being challenged by a goateed male. And it's the story of that foot race contest. More and more, I've thought of the psychological interests of men and women as can be dramatized in paintings for serious but also comic effect. And I think the outcome of Ovid's story Atalanta is distracted by Hippomenes' deployment of golden apples as they run. He throws these beautiful golden apples before her that slow her and allow him to win the race. But the subtext that's explicit in Ovid's story is that she knows she can beat the man, but she loves him, and she decides to throw the race and let him feel he won by guile with Venus's help. The complex dance between men and women that I think that myth captures where a woman is powerful but in some way agrees to a certain truce with the male principle interests me a lot. You've talked about the moral dimensions of painting. What do you mean by that? Art is the realm of metaphor, so I don't think painting or any kind of art is terribly persuasive when it literally proposes a morality. But I think to the degree that art might dramatize a moral position by the scruples of the practice, by the demands that the art makes formally, and also by a commitment to what I would call collaborative integrity within art, I think that can be really powerful. In my essays that accompany the show, I reference this neo-Christian writer named Simone Weil, who means a great deal to me, who has this funny formulation, all vice, all sin is perhaps the drive to eat beauty, that somehow our possessiveness, our manipulative energies are continually the threshold to suffering. And the temptation to that suffering is the temptation of beauty, which is kind of weird because we think of beauty as an unalloyed good thing. And I think it is, but we want to possess it and we want to hold it. When I'm painting, I'm trying to show an accommodation with beauty 
that adds to the sum of beauty rather than consumes it. Because I think most of the world sees beauty as something to be consumed, to be possessed. And I think that plays out for me even at the level of human relations. Like in my encounters with the people that collaborate with me in my pictures, I want them to truly be valorized in the pictures. I want them to be known through the pictures. As your ears have just informed you, Scott is one eloquent fellow. In his show catalog, he's included three short essays. In the first one, he talks about a table he was given from the family of his artist friend, Tilda Mann, after she died. Still life painters often have a group of favorite objects that appear over and over again. Here are some examples where Tilda's much beloved table appears in Scott's work. Look how Scott often has the two levels of the table represent different zones of existence, with a living model on top and images of the underworld on the bottom, the quick and the dead. In the same essay, Scott writes, it seems that every great painter has been a theorist of space as eccentric and rigorous as Schrodinger or Heisenberg. Eccentric indeed. Check out this truly weird painting called Two Tables, Two Rooms. Is this a simple still life set up with two paintings on the wall behind it? Or is this the edge of a wall with a receding space behind it? Mirandi would be jealous. But Scott also creates highly accurate perspective schemes in very complex paintings like these. By the way, the model in this painting is named Emily Jacques, and I want to give her a shout out for her photograph, the only image in Scott's catalog not made by him. She clearly took it with her phone as she posed, and it brings to mind one of Scott's favorite paintings, Las Meninas by Velázquez, who places the viewer's eye into that of the King of Spain, seen in a mirror, as he looks out at his court while the artist paints him. Emily's photo allows us to see through her eye what it's like to be painted by Scott. Scott is really good with models, as my Nancy can attest. Posing for Scott was really fun. He was talking to me and asking me about my experiences, and, and it was really very interesting for me. I would recommend it to anyone. I also want to share a key aspect of Scott's technique. He always starts with big patches of color. Detail comes only after the big relationships are well established. Here are some examples of paintings of paintings that demonstrate Scott's paint the forest before the trees approach. And finally, here are the essays, each one for four seconds. Feel free to pause and read them. It's well worth it. Scott's show will be up at Gross McLeaf through April 27th, 2024.